Father, we do thank you, just as Brian said, that you have betrothed us to one husband, Lord God, and we thank you that you've done that so that we might know him, Lord God, and that's, that's our heart right in this season that we are in, that we want to know you in that place of deep intimacy. We want to know you and the power of your resurrection. And Lord, we just cry out that you, we just humble our hearts before you and we want to hear your voice as, as Ken speaks. We pray that you would just come to us today, that you would hover over us and that we would hear what you were saying to us yes. individually yes. and corporately, Lord God. We want yes. to be yes. ready, oh God, for that day, for that day where it's the gladness of your heart, where your mother crowns you with the wedding crown, when she, and we see the gladness of your heart on the day of your wedding. Yes. Lord, may yes. we be those that are prepared, and I pray that we would have an ear and a heart to hear and to receive that word which is able to save our soul, and we just ask, Lord, that you take Ken out of the way and that you speak through him, Lord. He has all these notes, but Lord, we ask that you come and you impart life to them. We thank you that your words are spirit, your words are life, and we pray that these words would not come back void, but it would do that deep work within us, Lord God, within our spirit that would come into our soul, God. We ask for that sanctifying work of your spirit, even through the word your word is what sanctifies us, Lord, and we want to be sanctified entirely in spirit, soul, and body. So we ask that you speak, not by power nor by might, but by your spirit, Lord, and I pray that you would put in his heart, and in his, as he speaks, that you would put in him, and it would come out everything that you want us to know, we pray in Jesus' name, and just put whatever you want, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So stay up here just for a second. Uh, what I want us to do, let's stand up just for a second. What I want us to do, uh, the Lord put this in my heart when uh, Brian was making the declarations about betrothal. Uh, what I want us to do is I want us to, to uh, in a sense of a declaration slash prayer, ask the Lord to shatter every spirit of unbelief about who is the bride, a, a false doctrine about who is the bride, to shatter every doctrine of demons re related to who are the overcomers. Because those two issues are, are severely hindering the, a vast majority of the church from coming into the fullness of what God wants. And what, what Jesus wants is a bride. Jesus wants a prepared bride as, as his uh, inheritance, his eternal uh, inheritance to partner with him forever and ever and ever. And a lot of the theology of the church, the global church, is hindering uh, that from taking place, from that from coming from people from even understanding it. It's a, there's a lot of doctrines of demons out there related to who is the bride. And we want to just, I felt like the Lord said, to just make a declaration and ask for him, even through the teaching of this word and, and whatever other words he wants to bring forth, that the, that the false doctrine, the doctrine of demons about uh, who is the bride and who are overcomers, those issues, that, that would be that he would shatter that. His word, his word is like a hammer. Yeah. And let's, let's hammer these false doctrines. So do agree with me now as I, as I pray. Father, we come right now in the name of Jesus. Yeah. And we thank you that your word is a hammer. Yeah. Your word is a hammer. And we ask, Lord, as we make this uh, prayer slash declaration, that you would shatter false doctrines, doctrines of demons as it, as it pertains uh, to who, who is the bride and who are the overcomers, O oh God. Father, for there, there are many people that are being deceived by the enemy now, thinking that they, are, they will be the eternal wife of the Lamb, and, but they are being deceived by doctrine of demons. And we declare, we declare in the name of Jesus that these false doctrines shall come down in the name of Jesus and shall be shattered in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. And, and Lord, Amen. I want to add to that. We want truth to be shouted from this yes. place today, from yes. the housetops. Yes. Let your yes. truth go forth, Lord God, and accomplish it, what you want to do, Lord God, of waking up your bride. We ask that there will be a real awakening of the bride in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. You can be seated. Um, this is uh, session three of the uh, Forerunner School class that we uh, call the Theology of the Bride. And uh, the title of this uh, session is The Bride in the Book of Revelation, Part 1. The Bride in the Book of Revelation, Part 1. And we're going to deal with Revel primarily with Revelation Chapter 2 and Chapter 3 uh, in this session. What I'm going to do, um, for those of you that are part of the Forerunner School and uh, have, have been part of our Zoom calls and our teachings. We've had two sessions so far. The first one, we just dealt somewhat with the importance of understanding the bride, especially for forerunners, because, you know, as you know, forerunners are friends of the bridegroom. We're messengers and we're master builders, and we have to speak the, the truth of God's word uh, in the context of the bride related to the bride so that there will be people who will wake up to this bridal paradigm and then there will be those who will, will actively pursue making themselves uh, ready. Uh, and so we dealt with that understanding the importance of all that in session one. And then in session two, which I actually taught uh, here a few weeks ago here at church, was about the Jewish wedding system and entering into the plan of the ages and how that parallels our relationship uh, with Christ. And uh, now what we want to do, we, we, that was kind of an overview of the bridal paradigm, that we are betrothed to Christ. At the moment we are born again, we're betrothed to Christ as his bride. And, our, you know, in Jewish tradition and, and I think in, in Scripture, we are then called the bride. So we are the betrothed bride. We are the bride, the betrothed bride of Christ. But as that system shows that there's a, a lifetime in, in the, the bridal system, it was a year approximately, but in our life, a lifetime of making ourselves ready or until the Lord returns, we have that time to prepare our, our wedding garments uh, to be made ready for him. And those who have made themselves ready, Revelation 19, uh, will, will be the eternal wife of the Lamb. Uh, the, the one that will be the wife is the one who has made uh, herself ready and who will be the eternal partner with, with uh, the Lord. And so we talked about that a lot in session two. And so now we're going to make a shift in the, in the teachings uh, focus. We're going to spend uh, the next five sessions looking at key scripture passages that deal with the bride. Uh, really all of them, uh, all five of those come directly uh, from, the, from the mouth of Christ himself. Uh, deal with five different passages or five different uh, sessions that deal with the bride of Christ. And, to, and we have two objectives for that. What we want to do, we want to see, okay, what do these passages say? Uh, there are five passages. Let me just list them real quick and we'll... You don't have to write these down or anything, but there's, there, there are six passages that we're going to deal with in the book of Revelation. Six passages. Revelation 2 and 3, which is what we'll deal with in this session. Uh, Revelation 12, uh, Revelation uh, seven, uh, 17, 14, that those who are with him are the call chosen and the faithful. Revelation 19, uh, which is the bride has made herself ready for she has clothed herself uh, with fine linen, bright and clean, which are the righteous acts of the saints. And blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper uh, of the Lamb. We'll deal also with Revelation 19, starting with about 11 through 21, about the great processional. I'm really, really excited about that. I, that's uh, such fresh revelation to me. And uh, the more I've studied it, boy, I want to be a part of that recessional. I, I want to ride that white horse back with, uh, back with the Lord, part of his armies, as, as he defeats the kings of the earth. I want to be a part of that. I, you know, I just uh, am 
excited about that. But that's Revelation chapter 19. Then we'll deal with Revelation 21 uh, and 22. That, and that'll be three sessions. Uh, we'll deal with that over three sessions. And then we'll do a session on Matthew chapter 22, the parable of the marriage supper, the, uh, the, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. So we, we want to get an overview. This is what we want to do. We want to get an overview. Because remember, we're talking to forerunners. Those who are called as friends of the bridegroom, who will be messengers, who to to speak a word into people's lives to help Christ have that that bride prepared for Him. He is He is worthy. He's worthy to have a bride from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people group who has laid aside the cares of the world, the other lovers, the other pursuits, to focus their life upon him. He's, he's worthy of that. He paid the price, the dowry. The most expensive dowry that could have possibly been paid to purchase you and I and all those that we'll be speaking to to be his bride made ready. The dowry was his life. You know, it'd be one thing if it was the life of a man, a prophet. But it was the life of God. He paid that price. And he's worthy, he is worthy to have a bride who will give herself wholly and completely to him. Amen, amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. Uh, that was not part of the message, but anyway, so we're, we're going to deal with those sessions, those key things, and really all of them, because really the, the, the book of Revelation, uh, let me just read, well, I don't have it printed out, I won't read it, but anyway, the words of Revelation come from Christ through an angel, or directly from Christ to John, to us. So, these are, so even Revelation is the words Words of Jesus. Matthew and both passages in Matthew are the words of Jesus himself. So this is what Jesus is saying about his bride. And we want to understand that. We want to understand it. We want to get beyond just reading through it surfacely, surfacy and, and saying, okay, I think it says this or whatever. We want to really dig in so that we understand what, what the Lord says about his bride and what is needed to make ourselves ready. Because, you know, as we talked about in some of the other sessions, Revelation 19, 7, that when the bride has been made ready, then that's when the Lord comes back. That's what triggers the second coming. No matter how dark it gets in the earth, no matter what all happens in the earth, it's the bride made ready in sufficient numbers, whatever those numbers are, and only the Lord knows, but whatever that is, then he comes back. And so... We need to understand all this. We need to understand the depth of these things. And that's what we're going to be talking about uh, in these uh, next, uh, in these next th two se three se five sessions, actually. Three on the book of Revelation and then two, uh, two others. And there's some foundational things that, I have to, that I'm going to have to talk about, about who is the bride. But our objective is twofold. Our objective is, one, to find out what the Lord is saying to us about what needs to be accomplished to be made ready. And the second question is, who is the bride? Is every believer the bride, the eternal wife of the Lamb? Uh, that's a, such an important question and such an important question for forerunners because there's a lot of false teaching out there, in my opinion, false teaching uh, about that. And so we're going to try to dig into those uh, two issues uh, uh, if we can. And, and this session we're going to deal with Revelation uh, 2 uh, and 3. So before we get into Revelation 2 and 3, I want to I lay a little bit of foundation about some common views about who is the 
who is the bride of Christ? Who is the bride of Christ? And you would be amazed at the different views about this. Uh, but there, there, there are five different views, and I want to just go through them. I'll try to go through them fairly quickly. But you need to understand this uh, because, especially as a forerunner, you need to understand this because as you talk to people in various places, whether you're preaching to a group or a, a teaching a small group or whether you're talking to your next-door neighbor, whatever it is, there are different views out there uh, that are really widespread. And forerunners need to be able to understand those things so that they can speak truth into those who hold these false views. So I, there's about five views that are, pretty, that are pretty common. And people that you would respect and understand and would, would hold to some of these uh, views. So the first one, the first view, is that the bride is not, not a real entity at all, but just a way to describe... Um, certain characteristics uh, uh, about believers, like the bride would be not a real entity. There's not really a real bride. It's just a, it's a way that uh, Jesus described the purity or a close relationship or something like, along those lines. And that was a, that's a fairly common view in, in some parts of the church. And um, I use this example a lot, and I've, you've probably heard it, but I'm going to use it again. Uh, back in the 80s, 1980s, that's a long time ago, you know. But back in the 80s, I was in seminary, and we had a class on the doctrine of the church. And so the professor, who was a really good guy, I, I really do like, did like him, and he was a real man of God and had a heart of compassion and all those things. But he was describing the different parts of the church, different uh, examples like the church is the army of God, the church is the body of Christ, the church is this and the church is that. And he came to the bride and he said that the church, that's, a, that's just a kind of a description of certain traits about how believers need to relate, not, that there's not really a bride. And there was this uh, student in there who had a little bit of revelation about the bride but wasn't really able to articulate it that well. But anyway, what he said uh, well, because I believed, I agreed with the professor at that point in time. And what this student said was, you know, I think there actually might be a bride. Don't you think there might actually be a bride? And, you, you know, everybody in the class kind of like, oh, <laughs> you know, are you, are you kidding me? You know, uh, that was kind of the general reaction to it. Uh, and so he kind of just kind of... <laughs> shut up and sat down. But he was right. He was right. But, there, but anyway, that was a predominant view, and I think it still is a predominant view in certain circles. Then there's a second view uh, that there is a bride, that every born-again believer is betrothed to Christ as his bride, and when Christ returns, uh, every believer will be the eternal wife of Christ. Every believer will be the eternal wife of Christ. Uh, you know, from the most committed to the least uh, committed. Uh, and there's a, a quote in the notes that um, I, I want to read. I'm trying not to read too much, but I, I want to read this. This is the, the kind of the explanation of that view. Christ the bridegroom has sacrificially and lovingly chosen the church to be his bride. Just as there was a betrothal period in biblical times during which the bride and the groom were separated until the wedding, so is the bride of Christ separate from her bridegroom during the church age. Her responsibility during the betrothal period is to be faithful to him. At the rapture, the entire church will be united with the bridegroom and the official wedding ceremony will take place and with it the eternal union of Christ and his bride in parentheses, every born-again believer will be actualized. And so there's, there's, a, there's a, a common view, and I would say the predominant view in the evangelical church, this is the, probably the common view in the evangelical church, is that every born-again believer is now betrothed to Christ and will ultimately be the eternal wife of the Lamb, the eternal wife of Christ. Um, Probably almost all of the Baptist church and m many other 
denominations would hold that view. So it's a, it's a massive view. Yet, it's, it's not correct. It's not a correct view. The bride has to make herself ready. And so it's forerunners. I mean, maybe we even have that view ourselves. Because what does that view do? Well, that view, it doesn't, it doesn't motivate you to really pursue making yourself ready. You think, I'm, I'm going to be the wife of the Lamb. I'm going to live eternally dwelling with Christ on his throne. I'm going to dwell in New Jerusalem. Only those who make themselves ready in this life will inherit those things. Now, you know, we talked about this in our last session. At our betrothal, Jesus, our bridegroom, gave us a wonderful, wonderful betrothal gift, didn't he? The gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit, to, to the, with that Holy Spirit being our helper. He's going, I'm going to come right in here, live right here. Got plenty of room for him. <laughs> <laughs> he had a big work to do in me, too. <laughs> but to make me ready as I cooperate with him. So we're, we're blessed there. But that mindset has a huge issue, a huge uh, effect on whether we pursue and eagerly cooperate with the Holy Spirit or whether we say, you know, whether I'm lukewarm or not lukewarm, I'm still going to be part of the, I'm going to still be the eternal wife of the Lamb. See, a doctrine of demons, but it's, it's widely held, widely held. Third view. We just view is not as wide, but, I, but it's a lot more common than I thought. Many people think, okay, the church is, is not even the bride at all. It's just Israel. And I thought, I can't believe that. But then I started looking up, and it's just all over the place on the Internet. Uh, that it's because the word bride of Christ doesn't ever appear in the New Testament. They think it's not Gentiles, it's just strictly Messianic believers are that. But that's a false view to it. I won't spend any more time on that. Um, this, is a, this is a one that's really important too, this fourth one. But uh, it's, uh, it's wrong, I think. There's more right in it than the others. The bride must be made ready but God in his sovereignty will make it happen. God in his sovereignty is going to make it happen. Uh, and those who hold that view say, okay, there's going to be a massive end time revival. And, and, the, and you know, the persecution of the end times that are coming, there's going to be these two things that are going to happen in the end times, which I agree, those are the two things that are going to happen. There is going to be a, a bridal revival. And, and the point is that when those happen, that will make a lot of people ready as the bride. Now, there's truth in that. Uh, th that's, there's, I believe what that is saying, to the extent it says it, is true. But it doesn't, when, you, when people who hold that view would almost minimize the, the personal responsibility to, of us individually to make ourselves ready, to pursue that with, with hunger and thirst and intensity. But, there's a, but that view is held by uh, some very significant people in the body of Christ. Uh, it's, it's of all the ones I've shared so far, it's the best one, but, it, but there, there has to be an aggressive intensity uh, uh, that associated with this as well to make ourselves ready. And now, here's the, the fifth view is the view that we hold to, and I believe the view that Scripture teaches. It's called, I, I, we've named it the eternal rewards view, which holds that being the eternal wife of Christ is a reward that is given at the judgment seat of Christ to those who have made themselves ready. Being the eternal wife of the Lamb this is the eternal rewards view. The, being the eternal wife of the Lamb, being the eternal wife of Christ is a reward uh, that's given 
to those who have made themselves ready uh, at the judgment seat of Christ. And so, whereas every born-again believer is betrothed to Christ at the moment of salvation, and as such is the bride, is part of the bride, the ones who will be the eternal wife of the Lamb is a reward given at the judgment seat of Christ based on our life and though and the and they the ones who are granted that reward would be the eternal wife of Christ. Now those that don't receive that reward would still be believers, still go to heaven, uh, still have a a role in eternity, but the highest role is going to be to the bride. The closest intimacy, the greatest authority, and the, and the greatest part you being used throughout the ages, throughout eternity, will be the wife who has made herself ready. And that, is, I know, I just kind of feel it here as I look over the room, and it's, it, me as well, it's like, ooh. It makes it, it, lay, it lays out a whole different level of importance, doesn't it, to make ourselves ready. And as you look through the book of Revelation, as you look through it, you, you see this message coming through loud and clear, loud and clear from the Lord himself. As you look through the marriage, the, 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 the parable of the marriage supper, as you look through the parable of the ten virgins, it's, it's, the, the Lord is shouting it out, be ready, be ready, be ready, get ready. And the prophets are saying that uh, as well. Now, especially now, the prophets, uh, those that, that, that we all re respect, multiple ones, th they're saying, time is short, get ready, get ready, get ready. And it's more, a lot more than just getting food. I mean, as much as we need to have some extra food and, and other things, it, it's get ready spiritually. Make yourself ready. The time is short. And so we're going to look at Revelation 2 and 3 today. L let, me, let me read a couple of verses here. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy, the book of Revelation he's talking about. And heed the things which are written in it. For the time is near. That's the very beginning. Read, hear, and heed. And then Revelation 22, verse 7. And behold, I am coming, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. And then Revelation 22, 12 through 13. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And so what he's saying at the beginning and at the end of the book, he's saying it's really important that you heed what, we, what I say in this book. Now, what parts need to be heeded? I mean, all of it in a sense, but okay, there's going to be a hailstorm coming down from heaven, okay, how do we, I don't know what to do to heed, heed that. Uh, get in a shelter, I guess, or something. You know, I mean, but there are parts of the book of Revelation that have to be heeded. Revelation 2 and 3. Uh, Revelation 12, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they let, because they did not love their life, even to death. Let's heed, we got to heed that. All the issues in the chapter 2 and 3, we've got to heed those things. Revelation 17, 14. Who's going to come? There's going to be this great battle with the kings of the, of the earth. Bring it on. I'm ready. I'm, I'm not necessarily ready, but I, I want to see the Lord come back with that sword coming out of his mouth, riding that white horse, battling these kings of the earth. Hallelujah. Maranatha, come, Lord. Uh, you know, it's kind of what I, the way I feel about it right now with all that's going on in the world. I'm not sure that's the exact right. I need 
and needed more of a prayerful attitude, I'm sure. But who's going to be with him? The call, the chosen, and the faithful. I want to be there. Then there's going to be this processional. Jesus is going to come back and ride on a white horse, and the armies are with him. The armies are with him that are clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Oh, Lord, I want to do that. And then I want to be a part of that. Then the new heaven, the, the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem is going to come down. The new Jerusalem is a bride made ready. So we got to heed, but we have to heed what is taught in this book, in those, especially those passages that deal with things that we can do to make ourselves ready. We have to heed these things. And Revelation 2 and 3 is really a key. It's, it's, the, the, these, it's really almost like the key heeding passages. Because, it, you know, it says in Revelation 12, you know, they, over, because, talking about the man child, they, and we'll deal with that in the next session, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and the fact they did not love their life even to death. How did they overcome? They heeded predominantly these, met, these teachings to the, in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. He said, you know, you, you got to, oh, I have this against you. Overcome it. I have this against you. Overcome it. And the ones in Revelation 12 that had that testimony that they had overcome it were part of the man-child company. Revelation 19, 7, you know, the, the garments, the white garments are the righteous acts of the saints. Now, it's not how many food pantries you can work at. And if God calls you to do that, that's fine. It's not that kind of work. He's talking about those issues predominantly in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. He's saying, overcome these things. Overcome these things. And so Revelation 2 and 3 become almost like a, a, a you know, other, there are other passages in Revelation and these other ones we'll talk about are there too. But what he's saying is, you know, we need to really heed these things. And we're going to talk about overcoming here in a, in a few minutes. But let's talk about Let's talk about, and I'm not going to go through, obviously there's too much to go through, all of Revelation 2 and 3 in one message. And in our uh, Forerunner School class, the overcomers that Brian will be uh, updating uh, soon, will deal with a lot of detail on, on all, all of this. Uh, he'll go through each, chap, each church in, in detail. But if you begin to look at Revelation 2 and 3, uh, what you see is Jesus is giving, he's saying, okay, all this stuff's coming. All this stuff's coming. You know, the Antichrist is coming and all the different issues are coming. But I want you to be victorious in the midst of this. This is, kind of, this is what I, the way I interpret Revelation 2 and 3. All this is coming, but I want you to stand. I want you to be able to survive. I want you to be able to survive and go through it successfully, and I also want you to have the ultimate rewards that can come as a result of that. And so he gives us Revelations chapter 2 and 3 as guidelines and, and advice on what to do and how to live. You know, and so not all of it is related to the bride. I mean, a lot of it is related to just surviving. You know, uh, yeah, they're going to put you in jail for 10 days, but you know, don't love your life even to death. You know, just stand, hang in there and there'll be a reward for you. Be faithful unto death. You know, uh, I, I, Sardis in Philadelphia, don't, you know, when they come and they say, okay, you gotta, if, you've got to take the mark of the beast in order to buy or sell and you've got to deny Jesus. He's saying, don't, don't deny me because if you deny me, I won't confess you before the Father. But if, you do, but if you don't deny me, I will confess you before the Father. 
You know, so he's talking about a lot of issues that, that don't really directly relate to the bride. But when you look through those things, there are quite a few issues that do relate to bridal rewards. And let me just kind of touch on some of those. If you look at the church at Philadelphia, you know, Brian has labeled these, I think, accurately and correctly. The church at Philadelphia is the priestly bridal church. Uh, Laodicea as the enthroned bride uh, and uh, Sardis as the awakened bride. And I think the, those three really relate, those three met churches relate to the bridal paradigm. Uh, so let's look at Philadelphia. Here's, here's just some of the rewards. The, the promises. He said, okay, I'm, I'm going to make, if you overcome, and even to Philadelphia where he didn't have anything against them, they still had to overcome by maintaining, holding to truth and not denying the name of the Lord. He said, okay, if you do these things, if you live this way, I'm going to make you a pillar in the temple. You know, that special place of intimacy and respect and honor and authority and responsibility in the millennial reign of Christ and beyond. I'll make you a pillar, a place of, uh, of significance in my eternal millennial temple. He said, I'll give you the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. Now, we know from Revelation 21 that that is the bride. It's a bridal city, however that works out. It is the Bridals, it's a city, but it's also the bride. So in other words, he's saying, if you live like the church at Philadelphia, you'll be the bride. You'll dwell, you'll dwell in the new Jerusalem. That's, the, that's my promise to you, to you in Philadelphia. He said, I'll, I'll give you the name of my God. Prom and would you, we'll be promised to be possessed by God. And also, we'll get Christ's new name. You know how you know how we've got all the these couples that are getting married this year, and the bride will take on the name of her groom. Will take on the name of Jesus. He'll give us his new name. We'll be protected from the hour of testing. So that priestly bride will we'll have what the promise is, okay, hang in there. Don't deny my name. You know, the things are going to get tough. Don't deny me. Hang on to truth. Do these things, and I will give you the reward of being the eternal wife of the Lamb. You'll dwell in you, Jerusalem, and you will be my possession, and you will, be, you will get my name. You will be in that place of great intimacy and authority, and I uh, use you. Uh, you've got a little power now, but I'm going to give you great power in the age to come. Hang in there, though. Hang in there, church at Philadelphia. But there are bridal promises there that come with that. Now, let's look, we'll look quickly at these others. Let's look at the Laodicea. Laodicea was promised white garments. Bridal garments, you know, we see that from Revelation 19.7 and 19.14. The, the church at Laodicea, Laodicea was promised eternal dining. That word dine, I'll, come, I'll knock at the door and I'll dine with you. That's the same word as the marriage supper of the Lamb. Same word in the Greek as the marriage supper of the Lamb. In other words, you'll be able to dine with me not only now, but you'll be able to dine with me forever at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You'll be able to sit with me, Christ says, sit with me on my throne. And not every believer is going to sit with Christ on the throne. It's the bride made ready that will sit. Who, you know, we got, you know, King Jesus, and who sits with the king? The queen, the true queen, the bride made ready. So, but he's saying, he's saying to him, this is the promise of the reward but you, you've got to overcome lukewarmness. Warm, lukewarmness. You've got to uh, buy from me gold refined with, with fire. You've got to get eye salve. You've got to get, uh, you know, white, purchase white garments. You've got to do these things. But, th but if you'll do them, you'll get the reward to be able 
to, to dwell with me in, these, in this great place as my bride. Then we look also at Sardis, uh, white garments, bridal garments. You know, they're promised. Uh, some have white garments, and he's saying to the others, I haven't found your work satisfactory. Wake up. Wake up and put on these garments and you will get white garments and there are other promises there as well. To Pergamum, he's saying, I'm going to give you hidden manna and a white stone. The hidden manna is Jesus himself. The hidden manna probably refers to the manna that was in the Ark of the Covenant uh, and that was moved ultimately into the Holy of Holies. Jesus himself, John 6, Jesus himself is called the, uh, the, hid, the, uh, the manna that comes down from heaven. So he said, okay, I'm going to give you, I'll give you myself, hidden self, hidden revelation, hidden, that secret place. And I'll also give you the white stone, the white stone being admission to the marriage supper of the Lamb, most likely. And so he said, okay, you overcome, uh, you know, um, Pergamum, you overcome what I've listed there into that church, and I will give you these things. Thyatira. I'll give you authority, authority over the nations. I'll give you the morning star, uh, essentially authority as Christ's bride. I'll give you these things. The morning star, Brian's got a great write-up about it in uh, the Overcomers class that you can find on the Radical Pursuit. And I won't go into all that. So you see these, all these bridal promises that are made to the, to the churches, uh, at least seven churches. Now, not all of them are bridal in nature. Some, I'll protect you from the second death. You know, I'll do this and I'll do this. But in the midst of that, there are a number of them that are bridal in nature. But here's the issue. Here's the issue. This gets back to the, the bride and, and we're going to have to deal with overcomers here. Because every one of these messages, he says, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes, I will give these things to him who overcomes. Even to the church at Philadelphia, which they didn't have anything against them, they still had to overcome in order to get to that point of that place. And you had to remain in an overcoming state in order to get those things. So to him who overcomes, I will grant you these promises. So, to get the bridal promises, the, what Jesus is saying here, to be this bride made ready, there's a need to overcome. There's a need to overcome. Now, I want to deal with some different views of overcoming um, because this is another issue like the different views on the bride that's hindering the church from radically pursuing these things to be an overcomer. It's so important, so important that we, we realize that we are not automatically an overcomer because we're born again. We have to overcome the issues to be that bride made ready. Now, there's several views, I think four I've listed here, about overcomers. Who are the overcomers? This is, I mean, you would you would think, okay, everybody would believe you actually have to overcome these things to be overcomers. Wouldn't you think that people would think that? Uh, but they don't. Uh, I mean, most, I mean, probably there's a smaller percentage that do think that than don't. One of the major views is the all believers view. Uh, it holds that, that all are overcomers due to being born again if you're born again, you're an overcomer. That's the, the all-believers view. The, the all-believers view teaches that all believers are overcomers because of the very act of believing in Jesus. This view holds that believing in Jesus is all that is needed to be an overcomer, and that's based on 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. Faith in Jesus rather than faithfulness to him is emphasized in this position. In other words, both spiritually mature and immature believers are equally overcomers. Thus, all the rewards of Revelation 2 and 3 are automatically and fully given to all believers as being synonymous with the gift of eternal life. 
that this view believes that the thief on the cross will receive the same reward as Paul and John the Baptist. That's the all, all believers view. Now, there, I mean, there are a lot of people who believe that. I mean, probably many of your commentators believe that view. That, so there's no need to, to overcome. You know, I, I had a real personal, real shock about this view because I want to hit this view because this is wrong, uh, a wrong view. When I was back at the Baptist church and our pastor had left and I was like the interim, interim administrator or whatever for about a year during the search between the two pastors, I was trying to, I had this burden to, to lead the, the church on to, you know, a deeper walk. It was like, you know, I was like, I wanted to mature in the Lord and the church was so content being in the surfacy stuff. So I, got, I, I gathered the deacons and I've tried to work through them. Let, they said, let's work through Revelation chapter two and three. And I got the shock of my life, actually. Um, I, was saying, I, I was saying, okay, you know, we have to overcome these things. And it was like I was speaking Greek. What do you mean we have to overcome these things? We're already, we're already, we're overcomers. We're already overcomers. We don't have to overcome all this. And I was like, okay, it, it says right here, I have this against you. If you overcome, you know, if you overcome this issue, I will give you this reward. But, I mean, to the person, to the man, Every one of them was saying, We've already, we're already overcomers because we're born again. It was almost like, okay, what Jesus said in these messages don't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. It no, has no meaning whatsoever. Because I'm born again, I've already overcome all these issues. And I was a shock. But that's the all-believers view, which is, is really widely held. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the commentators... Uh, really do really believe that view. So anyway, that's the all believers view. And then there's the perseverance of the saints view. This is, this is another widely held view. You need to understand these things, especially as forerunners. The perseverance of the saints view. It's the wind of the Holy Spirit, I think. Coming. Here's the, wind, the perseverance of the saints. If you just hang in there, you know, you're going to face trials and you're going to face struggles, which we agree we all will face those things and do face those things. But if you just don't quit, then you're going to be an overcomer. Now, there's, there's truth in that. I mean, there's definitely truth in that. If we, you know, if we make it to the end without denying Christ, turning away from him, falling away, and all that, yes, we have, we have overcome to a measure. But that view says, okay, you, we're, let's just use Thyatira as an example. That view says, okay, yeah, the, 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 Thyatira had an issue with Jezebel, and the Lord, yeah, the Lord did say, um, I, I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, and for you to overcome her. Uh, but you don't really have to overcome that specific issue. Just don't quit. That's the perseverance of the saints view. Now, there are a lot of people that hold that view. And yes, we do need to not quit. I mean, I, I don't disagree to the extent it goes to. It's right. But it, it excludes the need to overcome the specific issues that are there. And what the Lord is saying is you have to overcome these specific things that I have against you. So that's the perseverance of the saints view. Okay, the loss of salvation view is, is the third view. And I, I'm hoping it's not being too tedious, but it really is important. The loss of salvation view of the overcomer. That you either have to overcome all these things 
or you lose your salvation or you're not saved. Um, and there, there are people who believe that, uh, you know, a, a fair number of people who believe that, that these, you know, these overcomer issues, only the overcomer is actually born again. Here's Mike Bickle. What, Mike Bickle doesn't agree with this, but this is what he said about it. Uh, the loss of salvation view teaches that believers are exhorted to faithfulness to avoid losing their salvation. In this view, failing to overcome is synonymous with losing one's salvation. This view implies that we must overcome all spiritual immaturity to avoid losing our salvation. This implies that only mature believers are saved. The diligent workers in Ephesus who lacked fresh, fresh love for Jesus would have lost their salvation if they died before faithfully renewing their first love. And there's a group that, that holds to that, significant number actually. And then here's the view that we believe. Again, we called it the eternal rewards view. Just like the eternal rewards view of the bride, the wife of the lamb, the, the eternal rewards view of the overcomers. In other words, that we are, believers are, are given these issues that Jesus had against them. Because these, these seven churches, they were specific churches, but they are also uh, common issues that the church of every generation, including ours, needs to deal with. Uh, especially as we get closer to the end times, these things are going to become really, really real. And so what the Lord is saying in this view is that to be an overcomer, and to get the reward that is promised, you have to overcome these specific issues. We're given our life in a challenge to overcome these things. We're, we're, we're called to overcome these issues. Just like to the work, to the message to the church at Laodicea. Okay, you have to overcome lukewarmness to get those rewards. There's a specific invitation to overcome a specific issue that results in a specific reward. Now, we're called to overcome them all, and how that really works, I don't totally know, but, the same, but the, in a sense that we are called, we're invited to overcome all of the issues that Jesus highlighted in these seven churches, to these seven churches. And to receive the specific rewards, we have to overcome those specific issues. Um, and so the bride made ready, this is what I, I'm, I'm going back to trying to understand. There's twofold objective. One is to understand what the book of these passages in the book of Revelation teach about the bride. Again, remember, a good many of them were bridal promises. And so to understand what he's saying is that we have to overcome these issues in order to be the bride made ready. We have to be that overcomer. We have to, the righteous acts of the saints are these issues that Jesus called us to overcome. And if we do that, then we get the reward of being the bride made ready. Understand everybody? I think, it's, I think I made it clear enough. Now, I want to, I want to list, I've got just a few more minutes here. I want to list some of the reasons why we believe this view is, is appropriate. Because this view is going to be an important one for forerunners to understand. And this will be in the notes, so you can, get, you can read more about it. I really want to encourage you to, to read the notes. For those in forerunner school, they'll be sent to you. And for those that are not in the forerunner school, it, it'll be on, uh, posted on Radical Pursuit under the class of Theology of the Bride. Um, here are some reasons why we believe this eternal rewards view. Uh, first, the natural reading of Jesus' messages to the seven churches supports this. If you just read, the, read what it says, he said, okay, if you overcome, I will get, if you overcome these things, I will give you this reward. So, I mean, just read it like, 
you know, it just like it says, it's like, okay, I, then if I want this reward, I've, I've got to overcome this issue. That that's the natural reading of it supports that view. The second one that Jesus indicated three times in three of the messages that he had something specifically against the church. Uh, to Ephesus, he said, but I have this against you that you've left your first love. And to, um, I forgot which church this was, but I have a few things against you because you, there are some who hold to the teaching of Balaam. I think that's Pergamum, maybe. The third one, but I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. So, you know, I mean, if, if Jesus said, I have, we'll use Jezebel, that's an easy one to understand. Uh, I have this against you. You're tolerating Jezebel in your church, in your life, in your walk. And to think that I don't really have to deal with that in order to get the reward is foolishness. You know, I have this against, I have this against you. You tolerate this. So deal with it, you know. I mean, that's what, you know, so that you get the reward associated with overcoming what he had against you. So that's another reason why this view is correct. The third is that the concept of an overcomer in Revelation depicts overcoming unfaithfulness rather than overcoming unbelief. This is really important. Uh, you know, a lot of the issue in much of the church that says that we're all overcomers just because we have faith in Christ and we're born again is based on John's writing in 1 John. And it says, 1 John 5, 4 and 5, for whoever is born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. This is the vi our faith. We, in other words, our faith has overcome the world. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, if you read that, when you read that, you think, okay, uh, when I'm born again, I've already overcome the world. So I'm already an overcomer because I have overcome the world. First uh, John Five. Mike Bickle in his notes really, uh, really makes a great explanation of the difference between that and Revelation 2 and 3. Here, here's what he said. He said, okay, in 1 John, they're dealing with heresies. And he says, when you accept Christ, you've overcome, you, you've put those heresies away, and your faith in Christ has overcome. So you have overcome those heresies. You've overcome in faith. The, that false doctrine, false teaching. But in Revelation 2 and 3, you're not dealing with heresies, you're dealing with faithfulness. And so he says, it's a difference. First John, you're dealing in faith, with faith in Revelation 2 and 3, faithfulness. And so it's a different issue. Y yes, we are a believer who, who, because we are a believer, we have overcome these false doctrines, but there's still a call to overcome these issues that would come against our faithfulness to be what Christ wants to be. So that's a big distinction that helps us understand uh, these things. Um, I think fourth, the, the proper understanding of the eternal rewards presented in Revelation 2 and 3 requires an understanding of the judgment seat of Christ. See, a lot of the, I mean, honestly, a lot of the body of Christ doesn't properly understand the judgment seat of Christ. I mean, back when, I, you know, until we started the church here and even years and years in, into it, I don't remember hardly ever hearing a message on the judgment seat of Christ. And if you heard one, it was something like this. Yes, we're going we're gonna to get a crown maybe for doing this, but we're going to lay it at the feet of Jesus. Now, we, we probably will do that. I'm not saying we won't do that. But that, 
that makes you, if that's all you hear about the judgment seat of Christ, you think, what you, what, you know, you think, well, okay, that's fine. You know, it, it, uh, that's true. I, I, you know, he's worthy. I'm, I'm not. But when you begin to think that the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to be given eternal glory, eternal authority, and eternal intimacy based on how you have lived your life and different measures of that. And if you talk about using the, the example of glory, it can be like a little faint star, 1 Corinthians 15, a faint star or as bright as the sun. You know, I'll take the sun. Uh, it's not a pride thing. But people don't understand that. That your position, your intimacy, your role in eternity is going to be hugely different depending on how you live your life today. And so that's why we need to overcome. The, the bride has to overcome. Uh, so that's that reason, and okay, that's the last reason. Okay, that's the last one. Now, I think there's another one in the notes, but uh, that's the, the last reason. Okay, let me let me conclude with this. Um, this is good. This is the way I like to look at it. The first time the word overcomer is used in the New American Standard is in Numbers chapter 13 uh, where they were getting ready to spy out the land and the Lord was saying to him, okay, you shall surely overcome it. You are an overcomer. You know, I've overcome. And so, you know, there's this concept that you are an overcomer. You are an overcomer. And then, you know, you get into the book of Joshua, you know, say, so every place your foot touches, I'll give it to you. You know, this is, it's yours. And I agree with that. That's, I mean, that's good. And, and so we are an overcomer. We're more than a conqueror because that word, you know, overcome means conquer and defeat. I mean, I, the, the definition is all in the notes. You are those things. You, you are that. But, and Israel was that, but they still had to go take the land. They had to go to Jericho and they had to march around it. They had to go to Ai and they, you know, get that, finally get that right. And they had to go on and they had to battle to go. And that's the way it is with us. We are a conqueror. You are a conqueror. You are betrothed as a bride. And you are, you have all you need to make yourself ready as the eternal wife of the Lamb. You have everything you need. God has given you everything you need. But you still have to put it to use. You still have to put those tools that God has given to us into action and to, and to overcome those things. And a lot of times, just like it was in the days of Joshua, it's a fight. It's a battle. You know, your flesh, the devil, the world, they don't want to release you from these issues you have to go through. But what the Lord is saying, and I'm going to bring it back, to close with this is that to be to overcome so as to be made ready he gives you these issues that are listed in these seven churches and, and there's other things the Holy Spirit who is our helper he will bring these up you, you know and say hey Ken you know you need to deal with this issue right here I mean, probably every one of us have some issue that the Lord is saying, deal with. Okay, and so you've got to appropriate his grace and overcome it. And then you go, whew, I got that one. Hey, Ken, there's, there's something else here that I have against you. And, you know, you spend, that's the way you spend your life. Now, and not every second. Uh, I mean, we don't want to be morbid introspectors. But there are seasons and times when he wants you to do that. And as you do it, you're more and more conformed into the image of Christ. And these bridal rewards will be ours when we one day stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of our life. And the, living this way is so important. It's part of our bridal theology 
to be that bride made ready. Yes, we are the bride. We're betrothed as a bride. But the eternal wife of the Lamb will be the one who has made herself ready. And to do that, we must overcome these issues. Now, Paul uses different terminology, but it's the same concept. And so, as we, as we bring this to a close, I want to, I'll try to answer these two questions that we've posed. I'll try to do it in each session. First one, you know, what does this scripture, what does this passage say? This passage, Revelation 2 and 3, is, tells us that if we want to inherit these eternal rewards, the bridal rewards, we have to overcome these things that Jesus highlighted in Revelation 2 and 3. It's, it's crucial. It's part of it. And the second one is everybody the bride. Everybody's the, and here's the answer. Everybody's the betrothed bride, yes, but the wife of the lamb is the one in the context of these two chapters who will overcome these issues that he has against the church, against us, so that we can be that bride made ready in the righteous acts of the saints being those things that he highlighted there. So that's the invitation. That's the invitation. And as forerunners, that's part of the message that we speak to the church. To be the bride made ready. Be an overcomer. Be an overcomer. Amen. 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 Let's stand up and let me pray. And, uh... Father, we ask that you would help us all to be overcomers, God. Lord, Lord, I don't want this to, pre, to heap guilt, condemnation on any of us, but yet at the same time, Lord, I want it to wake us all up, including myself, Father, for just even as you put Revelation 16, 15 on my heart, even this moment, that we want to be awake and alert so that we don't go about naked and you see, everyone see our shame. We want to be clothed in righteousness, Lord. So, Father, we ask for you to do a, an awakening and an empowering in every one of us, O oh God. And we do continue to shatter every stronghold of false doctrine about who the bride is and who overcomers are in the name of Jesus. Make us ready, Lord with joy, with joy in our heart. In the name of Jesus, amen, 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 amen. So.